Okay, well, I do have a question for her. Thank you very much uh, for remaining. Um, Dr. Wongafoga, I, I've got a question. I was looking at um, the references um, at the end of your, your testimony, and it's obvious to me that you have done a tremendous amount of research and extensive writing on the question and the subject of um, what it is that concern <laughs> parents or what it is that concern people who have children. Um, how big an effect would paid family leave benefits have on the question of retention of federal employees or even the recruitment of individuals? We talk about the fact that uh, we are always in competition with the private sector to try and find those individuals who would come. How much impact would you think this, this actually has on one's decision making relative to where they would go to work? Um, I, I agree with the, um, the speaker who, who spoke earlier about uh, the salience of these kinds of benefits for uh, young people uh, looking for a job, especially the kind of employees who are coming to work here, uh, here in the government. And uh, it, it, it's, the, it's the value of the benefit to the family, the substantive value, but it's also the signaling value that this is an employer who cares about families and who will be responsive to family needs, not just at the time of the birth of a child, but later on throughout the employee's career. So uh, I think these kinds of benefits are uh, hugely important in terms of recruiting and retaining workers. Uh, they're very salient in terms of the decisions that workers make. And I guess especially for those who actually have options, um, in, you know, in terms of you can either do this or do that, you can go here or you can go there. And generally those individuals who would consider, be considered as the best and the brightest are the ones who have the most options. And, and so let me just thank you and, and I certainly appreciate the fact that you stayed and we recognize that you have to leave. So right. thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ms. Tijani, you testified that last year one-fifth of your staff was on family leave. Um, That's right. <laughs> pretty interesting group. Yeah. <laughs> but how, 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 how much would you estimate uh, this cost or what impact did it have? Did it place any kind of financial burden or impact on the organization? Well, what the National Partnership was able to do was hire one temporary worker, so there was a cost for that. Um, we used contractors a little more, so there was a cost for that. And the rest of the work was parceled out among the staff who remained. Um, now, while of course there are financial costs to doing that kind of thing, what we got to do was keep all of our workers. The parents came back because of the leave that they had. And so whatever small cost we had in covering the work, we made money on it because we didn't have to retrain or rehire or find new workers because all of our workers stayed. And there's an immense amount of loyalty that comes into this. When you give people a benefit like this, they're much more willing to stay with you and to work hard when the next worker needs family medical leave and, they need, and other people need to pick up the slack. And so you kind of practice what you Absolutely. Preach. And, and, <laughs> and I think that's great also, I'll just tell you that I'm appreciative of your organization because the first major amendment that I got passed uh, when I came to Congress, your organization was one of the groups that assisted and uh, we're very pleased with that. Uh, Dr. Lovo, if the federal government only offers a short-term disability program and not paid family leave, do you think enough prospective parents sign up for such a program and would this benefit be sufficient to cover the needs of those families um, if only the dis short term disability program is in place? I think the issue about whether enough workers would take up a voluntary disability program is very important because we know from other benefits that are offered to federal workers that um, people who will need the benefit 
won't make the calculation that's in their best interest and they won't take it when they need it. For instance, with dental and vision insurance for the federal government, take up is only 10%. So with um, temporary disability insurance, if people don't know, if they can't predict they're going to need it, they have a choice between having a little higher take home pay or providing the, or participating in the insurance program, they may choose unwisely not to have the insurance and then when they have a, a difficult pregnancy or a long or a serious disability, they won't be covered. And that's one reason why I think the programs in the state such as California that provide coverage to all workers have been so effective and also so cost effective because it's they follow a, a kind of a better insurance model of covering all workers. So they pool the risk of their entire workforce meaning that premiums can be lower for individual workers. And when someone does need it, they have it. They didn't have to make a choice. Do I want to pay for this or for that? They're covered. Could you describe the best short-term disability program that you are aware of? Uh, the ones in the, in the five states that provide, that have mandatory short-term disability, which are California, Hawaii, New Jersey, New York, and Rhode Island are, are fairly similar in their benefit levels. They replace about 55 or 60 to 67 percent of a worker's earnings. They last usually, they give benefits usually for up to 26 weeks, although, although in California an um, employee can get disability benefits for 52 weeks. And they, they tend to be similar in the kinds of conditions that they, that they offer um, in terms of covering workers' own disabilities. Then in California, of course, they have now an insurance program for paid family leave for, for family care leave. So it's, I would assume that a federal program would be kind of similar to that kind of policy in the, that the state programs have. Well, thank you all very much. It seems as though my colleagues may have gotten way late or had to attend to something else and haven't gotten back yet. So I won't ask you to stay any longer. Thank you very much. and. Um, we're delighted that you were able to stay and be with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will now proceed to our third panel, and while we're setting up for them, I will go ahead and introduce them. Um, Ms. Colleen M. Kelly is the national president of the National Treasury Employees Union, the nation's largest independent federal sector union, representing employees in 31 separate government agencies. As the union's top elected official, she leads NTEU's efforts to achieve the dignity and respect federal employees deserve. Mary Jean Burke currently serves as the first executive vice president of the American Federation of Government Employees, AFGE, National VA Council. She has served as the council's national safety representative and has been a member of the council's legislative committee for many years. Ms. Burke is the secretary treasurer of AFGE Local 609 at the Indianapolis Veterans Administration Medical Center where she works as a physical therapist. Amy Costantino has worked for Health and Human Services since 1991 and is currently a team leader. Ms. Costantino is the mother of a nine month of nine month old <laughs> twin boys who were born three and one half months premature. Despite careful planning and conscientiously accumulating paid time off to care for her sons after their birth, the premature delivery forced her to make a difficult decision about whether or not to take her leave to be with her children in the neonatal intensive care unit or to wait until they were released from the hospital. We thank all three of you for coming. As the tradition of this committee, we swear all witnesses in. So if you would uh, rise and raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So record. The record will show that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. 
And uh, ladies, I thank you very much for being here, and we will proceed with uh, Ms. Kelly. Thank you very much, Chairman Davis. Uh, I appreciate you hearing or convening this hearing and having the opportunity to testify. When the 1993 Family and Medical Leave Act was passed, it was viewed as an important step in helping Americans balance family needs and work needs. But it, it was also just a first step. Since that time, it has become clear that many who would take advantage of time off for family or medical reasons have not done so because they were not able to forego that income. We have to ask ourselves, is it fair to have a benefit that many federal employees cannot afford to take advantage of? It is time for the federal government, as the largest employer in the country, to step up and make family leave real, not just a mirage that few can afford to use. NTEU applauds Congresswoman Maloney's efforts in H.R. 3799 and your support to provide this paid parental leave. Being able to substitute any leave without pay under FMLA with eight weeks of paid leave, in addition to any leave accrued or accumulated, will make a significant difference in the lives of both parent and child. According to Columbia University's Clearinghouse on International Developments in Child, Youth, and Family Policies, some 128 countries currently provide paid and job-protected leave each year. The average paid leave is for 16 weeks, which includes pre- and post-birth time off. The United States, of course, has none. In a time where there are dire predictions about being able to attract and retain enough employees to do the work of the government, when it has become clear that the federal government is going to have to step up in order to continue to attract the best and the brightest, this paid family and medical leave can provide a valuable incentive. Let me share with you the situations of just two NTEU members that exemplify the deficiencies of the present system. The first had her fourth child two years ago and took advanced sick leave to recover from the birth. She needed to maintain her income. Shortly after she returned to work, she was diagnosed with cancer. She had surgery and then chemotherapy. She was out for six months. Two of her children have asthma and are sick frequently. She now wears a heart monitor and must be checked by a doctor every few weeks. She still owes 60 hours of sick leave. <coughs> now she must take leave without pay every time she or the children need to go to the doctor, and she cannot afford that. Another member took advanced sick leave to recover from her pregnancy and, pregnancy and birth of her child. She still owes 162 hours. Her mother was diagnosed with breast cancer, and with two small children at home, she worked overtime to get the compensatory time to be able to stay home with her mother. She has postponed surgery she needs twice because she cannot afford to take leave without pay. She wants to be able to take time off to be involved in her children's activities, but she cannot see a time when that would be feasible. NTU strongly supports the eight weeks of paid parental leave in Congresswoman Maloney's bill, H.R. 3799. Sadly, even with that substantial benefit, people will still find themselves in trouble when a serious health condition befalls them or a loved one. Some form of an insurance program that replaces pay would offer support for employees to recover from an illness, to care for adult family members, helping to reduce or avoid the cost of nursing, to aid in the recovery of a child, or to care for a relative wounded in the war. Paid parental leave in combination with a short-term disability insurance program would provide broader coverage for these kinds of situations, both parental and medical, that we wanted to address when the Family and Medical Leave Act was first passed. Quite some time ago, OPM promised an outline of such a short-term disability insurance plan that would be available to federal employees, but we have yet to see one developed. Today is the first I've heard that they have some details out there in a design that obviously was drafted without any union input. And the $40 per pay period cost that they cite is one that will make this a program that will not be used by federal employees. State programs, such as the one operating in California, have resulted in an insurance benefit that everyone can afford, not just the wealthy. We would be happy to join in any discussions of providing such a program on a federal level, and we welcome your leadership, Mr. Chairman, in getting the facts and in pursuing a study on a short-term disability program to replace wages lost when taking family or medical leave uh, at much less cost than $40 a pay period and preferably at no cost to employees. In conclusion, it is time for the United States to catch up with the rest of the world by offering paid family and medical leave. Wouldn't it be nice if the federal government, once thought of as pioneering and inventive in its personnel programs, 
was at the forefront of this growing movement. And uh, of course, I would be glad to answer any questions, but if it would not be inappropriate, I would also, Mr. Chairman, like to thank you for your introduction of the bill to increase the age of children of federal employees uh, who can continue to be covered by FEHB insurance. This is something that has been identified as a very real need for employees, and I thank you for your leadership on that issue as well as so many others. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Kelly, and uh, we will proceed to Ms. Burke. On behalf of the more than 600,000 federal and District of Columbia employees our union represent, I am delighted to be here today to testify on the subject of paid parental leave for federal employees. Despite the protections of the Fe Family and Medical Leave Act, federal workers are among those who must choose between a paycheck and meeting their family obligations because they currently have no paid parental leave. H.R. 3799 would change this to provide income support for up to eight weeks of parental leave, and AFG strongly supports this legislation. Virtually all research on child development and family stability supports the notion that parent-infant bonding during the earliest months of life is crucial. Children who form strong emotional bonds or attachment with their parents are most likely to do well in school, have positive relations with others, and enjoy good health throughout their lifetimes. Spending time with a newborn or newly adopted child shouldn't be viewed as a personal choice or a, lux a luxury that only the rich should be able to afford. The only reason a new parent would ever go back to work immediately after the birth or an adoption of a child, even with the protections of the FMLA, is because she or he could not do without his or her paycheck. And far too many workers in both the federal government and outside must make this terrible choice. H.R. 3799 would allow federal employees never to have to make this choice. Some would make distinctions among adoptive parents, birth parents, mothers, and fathers. These distinctions are mostly irrelevant when the question is whether the worker should be able to continue to receive her salary during leave taken solely to care for a new family member. AFG also supports um, this legislation for taken as given that all parents, male, female, and adoptive, deserve equal treatment. Others have proposed creating employer financed short-term disability insurance as a means to provide paid maternity leave for birth mothers. This is not solution because it discriminates against new fathers and adoptive mothers. OPM in 2001 claimed that paid parental leave for federal employees was unnecessary because they have adequate options and opportunities to have paid parental leave through the accumulated sick and annual leave and leave transfer and bank programs. OPM's findings are both irresponsible and false. First, employees must accumulate sick leave to support themselves and their families if they are unable to work for a certain period. Second, federal employees are only able to accumulate a maximum of 30 days of annual leave, not enough time to provide uh, care for a newborn or newly adopted child, and an unlikely amount of time that the young workers most likely to become parents to accrue. Other federal workers, such as VA nurses, accumulate annual leave under a totally different process. OPM's blithe attitude betrays a vast ignorance of what it takes to raise a family successfully while holding down a job at the federal agency. Sick leave is not for when a worker is, uh, sick leave is for when a worker is sick. Annual leave is when a worker needs mental and physical renewal. Parental leave is for when a worker becomes a parent. Some will undoubtedly respond to paid parental leave bills with cries of fiscal prudence and affordability. No one can accurately project the cost of extending this benefit to new parents, but we can speculate on the categories of the cost of failing to do so. How much productivity is lost when a parent returns to work before they have found proper daycare for a newborn or a newly adopted child, or when a federal employee must come to work when she is ill because she has used up all her sick leave when an adopted child uh, she had eight months ago? How much does it cost the federal government when a good worker trained at taxpayer ex expense decides to leave federal works service for another employee who does offer paid parental leave? I also want to bring to your attention the dilemma of approximately 43,000 federal workers who did not receive the benefits of paid parental leave if H.R. 3799 is enacted into law. The transportation security officers, or TSOs, who work on our front line of national security at our nation airport screening passengers and baggage for threats to aviation safety. Federal courts have interpreted a fit note in the law creating the TSO position as allowing the TSA administrator the authority to deny federal workplace protections to TSOs. 
the TSO members, AFG's report that their applications for a FMLA are awfully, often denied arbitrarily and that they face retaliation and unfair discipline for attempting to exercise their rights under FMLA. Unless TSOs are granted the same FMLA and other workplace protections as other federal workers, including the right to collect bargain collectively, TSA's incredibly high attrition rate will continue and aviation safety will be imperiled. The time has come for federal government to set the standard for the U.S. employers on paid parental leave. It is clear that left to their own discretions, employers will not extend this crucial benefit to their employees unless their competitors or the law requires it of them. The benefits to children and families of eight weeks of paid parental leaves are enormous and long-lasting. AFGE urges the Congress to do the right thing and pass H.R. 3799. And th this concludes my statement. Of course, I would be happy to answer any questions. Then we will proceed to Ms. Costantino. Chairman Davis, uh, Vice Chairman Maloney, and members of the committee, I thank you for the invitation to testify today. I think if you wanted to, you could today. pull that a little bit closer. And, uh, I'm honored to be here. I have been a member of the federal workforce for 16 years. I am here today to ask Congress to consider a paid parental leave benefit for the federal workforce. This is a highly desired benefit for federal employees and would be an effective tool in recruiting and retaining a high-quality federal workforce. Last summer, I unexpectedly went into labor, even though I was just six months pregnant. My twin sons, Louis Anthony and Benjamin Abraham, were born on June 9th at three and a half months premature. Both of my sons had to be intubated at birth and placed on conventional ventilators. Their birth weights were one pound seven and one pound 11 ounces, and their immune systems were not existent. This is how my sons began their 90-day stay at the Georgetown University Neonatal Intensive Care Unit. I am pleased to tell you today that both of my sons are healthy, active, and curious, exactly what every parent desires for their child. As a new mother facing the mo most difficult challenge of my life, I was immediately forced to weigh my new personal responsibilities against my existing professional responsibilities. We had to make tough decisions about the immediate care for our children. Each day we learned more about what our sons had to face, phototherapy, blood transfusions, cranial sonograms, fluctuating heart rates, apneas, and respiratory distress syndrome, to name a few. We needed to figure out immediately how we would be able to care for our sons during and beyond their hospital stay. My husband and I both work full time for employers that have generous leave policies, but we still had to make the decision of when to use them. I had two choices. The first was to use the leave I had accrued over the past 16 years, which would have given me the opportunity to spend all of my time in the NICU. My other choice was to save the paid leave I had accrued so I could be home with my sons when they were released from the hospital. This would mean returning to work immediately and visiting my sons around my work schedule. After much deliberation and angst, we chose the second option. We knew our sons were receiving outstanding care. However, there are certain things only a parent can provide, especially the mother. If I were able to remain with my sons throughout the day, I would have been able to tend to all of their cyclical cares, which included feeding, holding, changing, and kangaroo care, which is holding the baby on my chest, skin to skin, to keep him warm. There's a dramatic decrease in the infant mortality rate among premature babies who are held in talk to. I will never forget feeding my sons after they were born. I would put no more than a thimbleful of fortified breast milk in a syringe and feed my sons through a tube. The NICU is a very busy place, and as talented and committed as the doctors and nurses were, they were still limited in the amount of time they were able to spend with each patient. Feeding my sons was one of the first bonding moments I shared with them. And I am certain that feeding my sons had a stronger impact than taping the feeding tubes to the sides of the isolates and having them eat alone, which was what happened when I was not present. There were other pressing issues that needed our immediate attention. Treatments had to be given expeditiously. We needed to be present to understand and approve them, and of course to support our sons. As our sons became more stable, it was incumbent upon us to spend more time with them, though they were still not mature and developed enough to leave the NICU. Finally, our sons were able to come home. It was a special time for our family. Since I had decided not to exhaust my paid leave during my son's stay in the NICU, I was able to use it when they came home. I was fortunate enough to have had accrued enough paid sick and annual leave to allow me to take off for two months. I often wonder, though, if I made the right decision. Maybe I should have used my paid leave while my sons were in the NICU. The Paid Parental Leave Act would create a paid parental leave benefit which would have far exceeded its value in terms of my compensation. It would have given me the opportunity to be with my children and the peace of mind that I had given them the best possible start in life. 
The, fa the Family and Medical Leave Act provides for up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave, which was not a vi viable option for our family. The follow-up care after our sons came home from the hospital required visits to the pediatrician, apnea clinic, neurosurgeon, pediatric surgeon, ophthalmologist, audiologist, developmental clinic, occupational and physical therapist, and three surgeries. The previously mentioned appointments alone would have exhausted all of the leave that I had earned over 16 years. We are very fortunate to have a supportive family who helped us through this time, and my husband and I are both extremely grateful for the caring and thoughtful approach taken by our employers and supervisors. I feel my agency did everything they could under the existing law to make the situation the best it could be for my family. I am here today to ask Congress to consider providing paid parental benefits to the federal workforce. This benefit would enhance our government's ability to recruit and retain a high quality federal workforce. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify before you today. Well, thank you, all of you. Um, on our way to vote, one of our colleagues implied that this was eight additional weeks of vacation. Um, let me ask how you all would respond to that notion, <laughs> beginning with you, Ms. Kelly. <laughs> I don't think I can respond on the record to that, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would be inappropriate. <laughs> I respectfully decline. Um, that, that says it all. <laughs> um, I agree with Ms. Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think it's very frightening that uh, anyone who would be making a decision like this, uh, even if it's a position they disagree with, even if it's legislation they disagree with, the idea that it could be framed that way um, just shows, um, I would say, not only a lack of information and knowledge, but, uh, you know, I, I could say a lack of caring or human compassion also. Um, and I, I would think the comment is absolutely inappropriate. Well, let me ask then um, either one of you or all of you. Uh, OPM stated in its testimony that new employees are people who have exhausted all of their annual leave and sick leave should borrow leave or, you know, borrow in advance and say, let me borrow, and then as I accumulate it, I can pay it back. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? In my experience, uh, there are situations where that is an appropriate tool and it does help an employee, but it's in very limited situations because even in the two examples that I cited in my testimony, what the position that puts an employee in is if it is something that requires continuing care or attention, uh, it's not an isolated incident that will end in one week or two weeks or four weeks, um, it puts the employee in a situation where they never are able to pay back the leave and then any other absences that they have to take, they're back in the situation of leave without pay again uh, or making them make choices as with one of NTU's members that she needs surgery and twice she has had to postpone it because she cannot afford, she has borrowed, she has advanced sick leave, she has not been able to pay it all back yet and she cannot afford to be on leave without pay to go and have the surgery that she needs. Yes, I, I would just add, just to let you know, um, it, it, at our local level, the first line supervisors are, do annual leave and sick leave. If you were gonna get advanced annual leave that goes up to the director's level. So uh, it's a lot more stringent in order to even get it approved. And it kind of depends on what occupation you're in and the position and uh, everything. So it's not just a free reign of who gets it and who doesn't as well. Um, and I agree with uh, Ms. Kelly in the fact that uh, once you start in this pattern, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's hard for employees to pay all that back and as they go along in the workforce. Well, do you think that short-term disability would take care of, does suffice for family leave? I don't think it's, I don't think it's uh, an either or. I think it should be a, a both. I think mm -hmm. the paid parental leave as um, offered in 3799 should be passed as is. And I think that is a giant step forward in addressing the situations that are so real among the federal workforce. But I think a short-term disability policy to supplement that, uh, as well as other FMLA situations, so that it is much broader and not just about parental leave. 
but I, um, I have to say I was very surprised um, and disappointed to hear what OPM reported this morning of the, uh, this draft design that they're going to be proposing because I see it as a, a program that will not benefit federal employees <coughs> if the program is rolled out the way uh, Ms. Kechak described it this morning, and NTU would not support that program. Well, let me ask you, uh, Ms. Burke and, and, and Ms. Keller, mm -hmm. um, can you think of any other benefit of, of family leave? For example, would you view it as being beneficial in recruitment of individuals to come into the federal workforce? Um, last year, the Veterans Health Administration, and I hope I'm quoting this correctly, um, noted that of their quit rates for registered nurses, and of course we all know how much we need registered nurses across the country, um, cited that 75% of those people left within the first five years. So when you take into account you know, that VA can't be a market leader, the next thing is to look at the benefit package. And it is attractive to people, um, especially, um, you know, uh, with um, women starting families later in life and having higher risk uh, pregnancies, uh, that there is a sense of security that this uh, bill would provide for. Um, Ms. Costantino, had, had this type of benefit been you been in effect when it was time for your children to be born, would you have made any different decision than, than what you ended up making? Yes, um, this benefit would have allowed me to not have to make the difficult decision and I would have been able to been at the hospital with my sons and use this benefit while they were in the hospital and use my accrued leave when they came home. And so it would have been of serious benefit to you and your family from Absolutely. any way that you would look at it. Yes. Well, thank you all very much. Um, Ms. Maloney. Thank you all for, for your wonderful testi testimony. And I'd like to ask uh, Amy Castantino, uh, thank you for sharing your personal story with us. It was quite an ordeal to have twins and you had to do what many federal workers have to do. You cobble together your annual leave, your sick leave, unpaid leave in order to meet your parenting needs. And as you mentioned, you exhausted all your leave to care for your children. Uh, from your story, I, I believe you're fortunate that you did not become ill <laughs> in the particular situation you were in. And may I ask you now, um, where does your leave stand now? And what are your contingency plans? Say, if the children become sick again, seriously, what, are, what could you do? Have you exhausted all of your I leave? Ha I have not that? exhausted all of my leave. I, ha mm -hmm. I, have, I have planned, um, but I would probably have to take leave without pay, mm -hmm. which would be a hardship for our family. And uh, I, I uh, Danny and I were going to the floor and we were talking about the bill. And one of our uh, esteemed colleagues called it, what do we call it, vacation pay. <laughs> and uh, the other one, uh, another one I was talking to said, well, you know, why don't they cobble together their sick leave and their vacation leave? That's what should cover it. Uh, so what is your answer to that, anyone? I think there are just so many very real examples out there, um, and not just in the federal government. Obviously, those are the examples that, um, that we have firsthand knowledge of, but um, there are so many examples of where that just isn't viable and where employees have had to make um, you know, choices, as we've heard described here today, um, in very real terms, and uh, decisions that employees are having to face every day, whether they lose their job and risk losing their job or can afford to not have the income. Um, and those are choices that uh, I guess I would suggest that I would like to see what um, uh, your colleagues who made these uh, comments said if they were in the same situation, uh, how it is they would feel if someone made that comment to them or about their son or their daughter or their grandson or their granddaughter. I, I appreciate it. And um, 
I, I just uh, have no further questions. I, I think this is a good bill. I, I hope the chairman will support it and mark it up and send it to the full committee. Uh, I think we've had a very good hearing today. The support for it is uh, very based on science and need is there. Uh, we are trailing the world, not leading the world, in terms of uh, providing this very important uh, benefit to families. And for a country that spends so much time talking about family values, it's time that we took some steps to uh, take the uh, word out of rhetoric and put it into the lives of employees uh, so that they can better balance uh, work and family. Um, science statistics show most men and women have to work. That's what it takes to uh, put the food on the pay table and pay the, pay the rent. And uh, we as a government, uh, in my opinion, should have more hearings like this, looking at ways that we can balance work and family and really uh, show that we are a government that uh, cares about family values and, and wants to work with parents to allow them to spend more time with their children. And I know it's heartbreaking when you can't get time to go to a doctor's appointment or you can't be at the school for the teacher's appointment. And, and you can't be there uh, for really important uh, purposes uh, because you're working. And I, I, I really believe that if there was more flexibility, you'd have a more uh, vibrant and committed uh, workforce uh, to be there uh, for the issues before us. So I want to thank you for what you do every day. And I'm very proud of the federal workforce. You do a great job. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman for uh, allowing me to join you today on this important hearing. Thank you very much. It is indeed a pleasure. I do have one additional question I'd like to ask you, Ms. Burke. Mm -hmm. um, you stated in your testimony that OPM's 2001 study failed to survey any of the employees who had actually left service during the years when they were having children. Are you aware of any ongoing efforts to survey this group of individuals? No, sir, I'm not. Uh, but we could get back to you if uh, I found out something. Well, we would appreciate that. I mean, okay. I think it could, in fact, um, be beneficial to know what their experiences have been mm -hmm. and how they have felt about whether or not this in any way uh, was part of the reason that they decided to leave. Again, let me thank uh, all of you for coming in and testifying, participating with us. I certainly want to thank my colleague, uh, Representative Maloney, for her introduction and the work that she has done on this measure for a number of years. And uh, it has been a pleasure, uh, Representative Maloney, to share another hearing with you. And look forward to doing so in the future. And with that, we will declare that this hearing is adjourned.